It's super fun when you get to go first and you get to flow your presentation right from the previous one. And also you get to be done nice and early. So thank you to Liz and Mike for that. So I'm gonna be talking about incidents here, but not just any incidents. The idea of this talk is to talk about the kinds of incidents that break our systems in really unpleasant ways. They take us down and they keep us down for a while. Those kinds of really bad days that most of us don't experience too many times in our careers. So a quick note about me. So uh, yeah, I was at Google for quite some time. I contributed some, to some books. Um, for my wacky fact, I'm a member of the International Committee for Robot Arms Control. We campaign to, uh, <laughs> thank you. We campaign to st uh, stop the development of use of autonomous weapons systems. For any questions about that or anything else that arises during this talk, um, I'm on Twitter, Laura Lifts, and you can find me on the SRE con Slack. So what is a black swan? It's an outlier event. It is hard to predict by definition, and it's severe in impact. The canonical example is the financial crash that we saw in 2008. Um, aspects of black swans, they tend to arise in systems that are correlated in some way, but that we don't, where we don't understand the correlations. In computing, most of the times that you get paged when you're on call or get tickets, it's more of a white swan. You know, maybe it's something that you understand pretty well. You know, you need to roll back a canary, or you need to restart something. It's something, you know, not mission critical. It's not something that's taking your site down. Everything is not on fire. Those are our white swans. Like I say, the black swans are the ones that take us down for a long time. Now, if you look closely at this picture, these are in fact not swans. These are geese. Pixabay gave me this image in, in an image source for swans. I left it in because I think geese represent pager noise and we shouldn't forget about that either. So black swans are unpredictable and unique. Yes, they are. But there are patterns. And we can understand those patterns and we can use those to create defenses. This is how best practices emerge. So, you know, in the last decade or two, um, a lot of people have realized that change is one of the major causes of failure and problems in our systems. So what do we do? Every change that we make, in, whether code, whether config, we, we can canary that. We can run it on a small subset of our production machines and see does it behave the way we want. If not, we don't need to roll that out fully. So we're not trying to predict every single piece of bad behavior here. We're testing it. We're testing it in a repeatable, automated fashion. This is a best practice that's emerged. What we're looking at in the rest of this talk are some other best practices that are emerging or can emerge. So first of note, I'm gonna talk about a bunch of different incidents that have happened to other people's companies. This is a little bit rude, um, but <laughs> you know, it's also how we learn. Uh, before I go, in, go on, I just wanna say, all of the organizations who I discuss here, I'm not throwing shade. My greatest respect goes out to those who talk about their production incidents and put them out there for the rest of us to learn from. This is a really good engineering practice and I thank all of the organizations. All of us have got black swans, by the way, in our systems, every single one of us. It's just not all of our organizations are brave enough to talk about it. So these are the categories of problems that I'm gonna talk about for the rest of this talk. We're gonna talk about hitting limits in our systems. We're gonna talk about slowness and congestion and how that can spread through our systems. We're gonna talk about thundering herds of coordinated demand and how, that can, how those can happen and how we can defend against them. We're gonna talk about automation interactions and complex systems. We're gonna talk a little bit about cyber attacks and we're gonna talk about dependency loops. So first, hitting limits. I, I think we've all gone out of quota for something at some point. You know. We know that this can be catastrophic, we know that this is common, but there's a lot of different ways that we can hit limits and we don't always think about all of them. So here's one example, and this was one of those really, really bad days in production, and I felt super bad for the Instapaper people uh, at this time. They had a production DB on Amazon MySQL. They were, on, they were backed by an EXT3 file system, and they hit the two terabyte limit, and everything just stopped accepting writes. So they didn't know that this was gonna happen. It was unanticipated. They ended up having to dump all their data and re-import it into a database backed by EXT4. They were down for a long time. So that was a, you know, a sort of a hidden limit in their system that they didn't know about. 
Now, it turns out I spoke to an Amazon engineer about this after I first gave this talk, and he was like, yeah, they could have just you know, changed. They could have uh, imported their uh, file system directly into ext4 from ext3. This, of course, is one of those amazing counterfactuals that we shouldn't have in our post-mortem analysis. And these are exactly the sorts of things that we don't think about under stress. So Sentry, um, they are an error collection service. They were down for most of a US working day. What happened to them was they maxed out their Postgres transaction IDs. Uh, Postgres uses transaction IDs to implement transaction isolation, and basically it goes around and they reuse a 32-bit integer. So they also have a process that cleans up these integers and reclaims them. But if that isn't keeping, tra keeping pace with your transactions, your write transactions, you can run out, and Postgres will just stop accepting writes. So they had a pretty bad day, and they had to truncate a database table to get back up and running. Luckily, it was ephemeral data that they didn't need too badly. Now, I've also seen a very similar um, incident, at least one, uh, by Joint. So this is a, a sort of something that's bitten at least two people. The interesting thing here is it's not like the, the Instapaper case. This is not like a hard resource that we're, we're running out of. This is, this is a sort of a logical resource, so we need to think about those as well. So here's SparkPost. Um, this was actually from a talk that they gave at SREcon Americas last year, I think. They are a bulk email provider, and they had an incident where they were unable to send mail for multiple hours. So being an email provider, they do a lot of DNS lookups. Um, they had recently expanded their cluster in AWS, and they hit an undocumented limit. So Amazon, they have a, uh, a connection tracking firewall that's uh, set up on a per cluster basis. There are limits on the number of connections that you can make into that over a, over a sequence of time, and they, they're high limits, but because SparkPost have a pretty unusual workload, they hit them. So here's another, another limit that's not a hard sort of resource limit, like, like disk size. It's, it's another logical limit that we can hit. Here's Foursquare. Um, they have a clustered Mongo setup, or they did in 2010. They may not anymore. One shard hit the, the RAM limit on the machine. What happens then is performance was unacceptable. So they needed to reshard, and resharding when you're at maximum uh, capacity is pretty hard. Here's a company called Platform.sh. They have a, uh, they have, uh, they use Zookeeper and they have an orchestration system that queries Zookeeper. They did some maintenance and they needed to restart their orchestration system, but it wouldn't restart. And the reason it wouldn't restart was another one of these sort of logical um, limits. They have a, um, they had a pipe um, and the queries were running through the pipe. It had a 64K limit and because their Zookeeper nodes exceeded that limit, they, were no, they, they weren't able to start their orchestration software. So you know, while their site was down, what they had to do was to go and add proper semaphore logic around it to work around this, which is not really something that you want to be doing while your site is down. But fair play to them, they did great. So we've seen here that limits problems can strike in all sorts of ways. It can be system resources like RAM, it can be logical resources um, like buffer sizes, like IDs, it can be limits imposed by your providers and many others. So we often think about the sort of you know, system, physical system resources and, 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 look, and look at how we're doing with those, but there are a lot of other things. And the problem with the logical limits is they can surprise us and they're not necessarily always easy to change or control. So what can we do? I think the answer to this is better load and capacity testing. Um, I think that we should always be including write loads in our load tests. Um, not including write loads gives you a really, unrealistic uh, a really unrealistic picture of your system performance. If you're including write loads, set up a replica of prod and try and increase all of your data sets past your production size. This should give you ideas of where you're going to hit limits in the future. Don't forget your ancillary data stores, things like your Zookeeper nodes. These count as well. Test startup and test any other operations in your system, like backups and resharding, with larger size data sets to make sure that those kinds of operations are not going to hit any of these hidden limits either. Sometimes we know about limits in advance and they're pretty far away. And by the time that we actually hit those limits in our systems, all the people who originally knew about them have gone, right? 
The best documentation is a monitoring alert. Um, you know, hey, future me, four years, or future me who's doing my job in four years, this, this is what you're about to hit. The, the harder the architectural changes need to, to your system to cope with the, the limit, the more, the more warning that you want. A line on a graph that's a constant reminder of when you're going to hit a limit can also be quite powerful as well. So our second kind of problem, spreading slowness. What does this mean? Here's an example. So uh, last year in February, hosted Graphite, Amazon Web Services had problems and hosted gra Graphite went down. But they're not on Amazon Web Service. So what happened was their load balancer connections were being monopolized by companies that, or organizations that were calling them that were in AWS. So their, all their thread pools were getting saturated, or connection pools. So this is exactly like a, um, a network attack called Slow Loris that was used against the Iranian government in 2009, quite, in, quite interestingly, except it was not done deliberately, it was by accident. Um, here's Spotify. So they have, a, they have microservices. One of them is a playlist service that gives you the playlists for a particular user. That got overloaded because a new service started using it. They rolled that change back, but they already had these huge um, outgoing request queues, and they also had verbose logging that was complicating their problem as well. Um, so they, the, one of the big problems that you get with these um, spreading slowness issues is you get these sort of queues and backlogs, and a little, uh, one problem in one part of your service just spreads and sort of overwhelms the whole thing. It's really hard to get your service back in a good state under these conditions because of these huge queues. So what they have to do is you have to restart your services behind firewalls. You have, you have to like, lock your users out for a while so that you can get everything back in a good state and start serving again. So these kinds of spreading slowness issues, they really exacerbate any, any outage that you have. Here is Square, one of a payments company. They have an authentication system, as most of us do. It depends on their Redis instance. Redis had gotten overloaded because one of the Redis clients was retrying a transaction up to five times, completely saturating Redis, and therefore preventing anything else from being able to query it. So what's our defense against these spreading slowness problems? You want to fail fast. Don't fail slow. Don't fail fast. Set timeouts on all of the interactions between your services. You know, th think, how long do you expect this, this transaction to take? How, how long is it useful to take? If it's, if it's something for an end user, something that they're waiting on in an interactive way, there's really no point in waiting 10 seconds, right? The user's gonna have hit reload by then. Um, you've got to limit retries. And you've got to be smart about your retries as well. Any, any operation that you do retry, use exponential back off and add a little bit of randomness so that you don't get coordinated waves of retries hitting your systems. The circuit breaker pattern is quite useful here as well. This, this shares information across um, all of the um, processes running on a single client. Um, so instead of having to you know, have each thread in your, in, your, in your software, realize that your auth service is down and limit the retries. You, know, you just need to see that across a certain number of times across all your threads, and then the circuit breaker can kick in. Fundamentally, what all of these problems are is some research is, resource in your system is getting saturated. And fixing these problems tend to be figure, a matter of figuring out what, what's saturated and where, and then unwinding all the damage that, 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 that that's done through your system. So it's very useful when you're creating your monitoring dashboards to think about saturation, utilization, and errors. So think, make these first-class citizens in your dashboards when you're designing them. It's the quickest way to identify these kinds of bottlenecks and issues. Um, and again, like with limits, it's not just about physical resources. Think about your logical resources, connection pools, thread pools, locks, and all those things. Thundering herds. Thundering herds are not all as cute as this one. So Nassim Talib, who I referenced at the start of this talk, he says the world is very correlated, and it is, and our systems are very correlated too. And that's why rare events happen more often than we think that they should. So, Coordinated demand, like a, a big wave of requests hitting your service all at once. Where does it come from? It can arise from end users. So um, 
I think those of us who've run big web servers are aware of, or web services are aware of what happens when another big web, web service goes down. Everyone logs onto your one and goes, well, why is the other one down? You know, um, things like New Year's Eve or big sales, um, those kinds of events can organically create big thundering herds of users. But most often, this comes from our systems themselves. So people love to start cron jobs at midnight. You know, it's a very nice round number. Try and discourage that. Um, if you have a mobile client for your service that does some kind of updating, that needs to be randomly smeared across the time period. You don't want them all doing that at a given time. Um, if you start a really large batch analysis job or any sort of big job, that can create a thundering herd for its dependencies. So those are some kinds of examples of ways that we can get coordinated demand. But there are others. So, right, so I'm the, I left the Slack, this slide in. I work for Slack now, but I literally just signed papers last week, so I haven't seen their internal version of this postmortem yet. So I'm just going to give this talk like I did the last time. They, <laughs> they had two incidents in 2014. Um, they have this, the, you know, the nature of the product is that they have really long um, sessions with their users. They needed to restart a couple of their boxes. And what happened then was all of the clients connected to those instances failed over en masse to other ones. And when the session starts up, it needs to read a bunch of data, and that, that saturated their databases. So they had a bottleneck there. Um, and they had a thundering herd. The thundering herd was, unfortunately, of their own making. So Circle CI. Here was a thundering herd of someone else's making. So Circle CI are obviously a um, continuous integration build um, company. They, they, they get a lot of requests from GitHub or triggered by GitHub. GitHub was down for a while. It came back up. Things had still been happening while it was down, so a huge surge of demand hit their systems as soon as GitHub came back. Um, at the time, they had a pretty heavyweight system for scheduling jobs into their database, and they, they wound up with huge database contention. So a thundering herd that came because someone else's service was down and came back up. The best defense here is planning for it. I think a lot of us say, well, you know, we, we're going to make assumptions that the load on our services is going to be well behaved. It's going to be you know, pretty even. We're not going to see these big peaks and troughs. But I think that pretty much any internet facing service, and sometimes internally facing services also, can face a thundering herd. So it's best to assume that you're going to see this and to plan and test for what's going to happen. So you can have a degraded mode. You can do things like queue input in, 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 into, a, into a queue um, in a very lightweight fashion and then process it later. Um, you can drop requests that are less important. The main thing is know what you're going to do in advance and test that it works. You, know, you don't want to find out when you're actually under that kind of load that your system can't handle it and does something that you don't want. Automation interactions is our next, uh, our next interesting category. So I was at Google while this happened. Um, an engineer tried to just uh, send one rack of machines to the program that erases disks when we're done with the machines. But unfortunately, uh, due, to, due to regexes, essentially, they, they sent the entire global CDN. So every single, disk, uh, every single disk in all the machines that comprised Google CDN was erased. And that is not easy to recover from. That took a couple of days. Um, now, because people did an excellent job capacity planning, um, Google wasn't hard down. They were just a little bit slower for a couple of days. That's all. Here's another example, pretty different at Reddit. They were doing a Zookeeper migration, and they turned off their autoscaler so that it wouldn't read from Zookeeper during the migration process, which makes sense. You, you, you don't want um, your, your, your automation working off bad data. Unfortunately, they had an automation that turned their autoscaler back on. Oops. So their autoscaler got confused and because it read bad data, and it turned off most of their site, so Reddit was down. These kinds of automation systems, I mean, like most of our systems generally, they're complex systems. Complex systems here mean multiple interesting parts, system state, and feedback loops. 
we can't predict how these things are going to work. They're inherently hazardous, like, like the very smart Richard Cook says. Uh, and the speaker after me is going to be talking more about complex systems. They're fascinating. But our automation systems, they, they interact with our systems. They interact potentially with humans. They're interacting with a lot of stuff, and things can go wrong. I strongly believe that we should have constraints services that limit how our automation operations work. So how many, how many times can our automation fire in, per day, per hour? Set lower bounds, so we should never have fewer than 100 tasks in this job running. Maybe we don't want to reduce capacity or do any sort of you know, dangerous operation if our service is not within SLO. You know, these are things that we can think about. We should always provide an easy way for any on-call engineer in our organization to disable automation. And we should test that they work. Have, have somebody hit the, reg, the, the button during, um, during onboarding when you're getting a new engineer on call. That means that you're going to be continuously testing this. And it, mean, it also checks that your new engineers have actually got the privileges to do this. Really, really important, in order to diagnose when your automation is doing something crazy, make sure that all your automation is logging to one place, every piece of it, every piece of, organ, of automation owned by any team, in your, in, your, in your whole organization, have it logged to one place that you can search all together. And then you can figure out when these interactions are happening. OK, cyber attacks. Only one thing in this category, but this is, this is probably bigger than all of the other outages that I discuss all together. So this is the shipping company Maersk, and they got infected by a piece of malware called NotPetya. They turned off their entire global network to try and stop the spread, but basically it got everywhere really fast. This means that they couldn't unload ships or take bookings. They lost, um, as a company, they lost 300 million, but there was a whole bunch of other companies that lost a lot of money because they couldn't ship their produce. Um, you know, there was large companies that shut down production for several days or weeks because they weren't able to ship the things that they were producing. So the overall cost of this was billions. The problem that they had, they had one piece of accounting software in one of their corp offices that manages to infect their entire global network. So it's pretty important, and this is something that we can help with as SREs because we understand, hopefully, how requests and how things flow through our systems. We can contribute to helping to segment off parts of our networks from each other. We can think thoughtfully about how do we control our, our jobs in prod. We probably don't want to have full access between corp and prod. At Google, they have a pretty great thing called Beyond Corp, which is worth looking at. We also need to think about what are the, what's the worst possible blast radius for just making a mistake. You know? These things are a little bit in tension with being able to easily and powerfully operate our systems, but this, I think this is one of the things that we as SREs should all be thinking about. So here's our last category of problems. These are dependency problems. So ask yourself this question. Do you know that you can set up, start up your entire service from scratch? With, no, with nothing running already. This is quite hard, and it's pretty rare for any of us to do this. The reason that this is important is because sometimes you will have a simultaneous reboot of everything, and then you have to do this. And that's quite a bad time to notice that you have these kinds of circular dependencies. So your storage infrastructure depends on your monitoring to decide where to, you know, where to start up its shards or something, and that depends on your storage being up bad. So I should say, by the way, a lot of this comes from work that Tanya has done, and she has written, she's here in the front row, and there's a great ACMQ article by her, which is in the links, which is at the end of the slide deck. So GitHub had an outage that was caused by 25% of their main data center rebooting. Some of the machines didn't come back, and it was enough to make their Redis cluster unhealthy. Now, they had intended Redis to be a soft dependency for the rest of their systems. They intended to be able to operate without Redis. But as so often happens, a soft dependency became a hard dependency, and they were not able to start up until they had, re they had rebuilt their entire Redis cluster. Here's another example from Trello. So Trello keep their, um, the resources for their front-end web app in S3. They also have an API service for their mobile um, client. That should have been unaffected, but actually it wasn't, because they put a check in their mobile API, that, uh, in, their, in their API service, to check that their front end was up. It didn't need to be up, but they had that check anyway. So they exacerbated their outage with this, with this check. 
So the defense against this is layering and testing. You'll notice I talk quite a lot about testing here. You want to layer your infrastructure. What's the bottom layer? What's, what's the next layer up? You should only have dependencies down the stack and not up. This prevents loops. You should regularly test. How long does it take to bring everything up with a full set of data? Is that actually acceptable as well? How long would you be down if everything had a coordinated reboot? Think about soft dependencies. Soft dependencies can very often become hard dependencies unless you're constantly testing. So if, you, if you're planning to have a soft dependency, plan for a way to, co to constantly test that it's a soft dependency and not a hard dependency. So this wasn't an exhaustive list. I can think of a lot of other things that can take our systems down in nasty ways. The point of this list is it's a list of things that I think we can do something about. It's a list of things that I think are best practices or emerging best practices for us in our industry. There are other defensive strategies. So chaos engineering, fuzz testing, and disaster testing drills are all excellent ways to, to ensure that our systems are behaving the way that we expect them to, the way we want them to. Having a good incident management process. So many of us use ones that are based on FEMA's incident management system. Practice using it all the time for anything that's a non-trivial incident. Any on-caller should, should be able to summon help. You know, if I need to get hold of my VP of engineering to make some critical decision or pay for something during incident response, or just to get another bunch of hands on deck, I should know how to do that. So it's great to have a pager alias for like a higher level cross-functional incident response team. Communication. Um, it's great to have, a, you need to have a way of communicating during an incident that does not rely on your own infrastructure. There are lots of ways that your entire corporate network can go down. Your, your cloud provider can go down. So have a backup that doesn't share any of your infrastructure dependencies. You can have an IRC system that's installed somewhere else. You can have a phone bridge, although ask your phone bridge provider whether or not they might be using the same infrastructure as your cloud provider. Um, make sure people, um, especially key technical people and executives, know how to get on there. So maybe a laminated wallet card. It's simple, but it works. And practice. Practice, practice. If you do annual dirt testing, it's a great time to practice a lot of the things that I've mentioned here. Prioritization and budgets. So it's become common practice in SRE these days to think about error budgets and sort of base a lot of our work on those. If we're within error budget, then everything is good. If we're within SLO, everything is good. But looking at our error budget over the past several months or years, it doesn't really tell us about our risk in terms of these black swan incidents. Any one of these happening once can blow your error budget for the decade, maybe the century. So it's good to prioritize. It's, it's, you, you shouldn't forget about these kinds of issues in your, in your prioritization. You know, budget some time. Budget some time for these risky things. Psychology, it's, it's, hard, it's hard to be on call for these kinds of major incidents. So, you know, if you're, if you're a manager or a tech lead and your team has been dealing with this, you know, think about getting someone to take the last bit of time of someone's on-call shift. If they make sure people have a chance to go home and sleep and eat, you know, try not to have people staying awake for 48 hours dealing with major incidents. That's part of your planning too. So further reading, I think everyone in this industry should read um, Release It by Michael T. Nygaard, and I don't think everyone has. It's a great book. I've been recommending it for years. Um, I got a lot of the postmortems that I reference here from Dan Liu's postmortem page and from Essary Weekly. But if you look at the slides when they're posted, every single incident has got a link to an article or a write-up. Finally, I should say that my brand new colleagues at Slack are hiring. <laughs> Slack is used by very, very many people to automate their infrastructure operations. So I think we're a really critical internet service. It's one of the reasons that I chose to join them. Um, we're out in, in one of, I think, the FAR ex exhibition hall. Credits for where I got my amazing resources. Um, I'm not sure there's time for questions. Probably not, Liz, right? You've got three minutes. You I two questions. Oh, I can take two questions. OK. Do I have two questions? You can find me afterwards. I'll, I'll, give my, uh, I'll give my next speaker time to set up. Oh.
Oh, I had, I had one question. I figured she might repeat the question, but I was just going to say, if someone looks at all of this, reads all of this, and wants to get started, what one thing do you think they should go back and do as soon as they get back to the office? Um, I would say, in, in terms of the walk, crawl, run approach, you want to make sure that you have that backup communication system. That's, that's as quick as an IRC or a phone bridge and a laminated wallet card. Then after that, think about the incident command process. Then after that, I think probably looking at your deadlines and your load shedding, those will be the order that I would tackle in if you're coming from zero. So, yeah. But every organization is different, you know. Cool, okay, thank you very much. <laughs>